spirit would have free course in this place. Come against distractions, come against physical and mental impairments. God, we pray that you would have your way in this place. We don't want flesh to be glorified, God. We, we want you to be magnified in this place. So I ask now, God, in spite of my fatigue and my faults and my failures and my sins and shortcomings, God, use me to speak your word to this, your people. I thank you, God, for what you've already done. Thank you, God, for what you're doing. But I thank you even more for what we believe you're getting ready to do in this place. I pray now, God, for my sisters and my brothers who are under the sound of my voice. I don't know what they're going through. I don't know what the problems are. But I pray now, God, that you would manipulate my mind, orchestrate the words that are coming out of my mouth to speak power to truth in this house today. We need you now. We ask this in the only name that matters, the name of Jesus. And the church said, Amen. While you're still standing, the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, and we will revisit Malachi the first Sunday in December. Amen. We'll revisit Malachi. Senior Saint Day is today, and our guest, Archbishop Leroy Bailey, will be preaching at 9 and 11. And I just want to, as last week, just share a word of encouragement to someone, and we'll resume our series in Malachi. I hope that's all right with you. Amen. Uh, Malachi, Matthew chapter 14, uh, commencing at verse 13. It's a familiar text, and as you're finding it, let me thank God for our pastors who are here, uh, all three of them, and our ministers in the pulpit, in the pew, and Reverend Thomas Yutse, and to other guest ministers, if there are any. And we thank God for all of our members of our diaconate ministry who are here with us, as well ushers and musicians, and each of you, my Heavenly Father's children. Um, Matthew chapter 14, verse 13 through 21. Uh, familiar narrative, familiar story, but uh, God, God gave me a fresh, um, a fresh um, a drink from this old well. And I, I want us to look again, um, if you don't mind. Don't let the familiarity of the text cause you to miss what God wants to say to us today. Matthew uh, 14, beginning at verse 13, it says, Now when... Jesus heard this. He withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. And when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and, and he had compassion for them and he cured their sick. And when the evening came, the disciples came to him and said, Master, this is a deserted place. Um, the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said unto them, don't miss this. They need not go away. Give them something to eat. And they replied, we have we, we, don't, we don't have much. All we have is five loaves and two fish. And he said, bring, bring what you have to me. And then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass and taking the five loaves and the two fish. The Bible says he looked up to heaven. He blessed it and he broke the loaves and he bestowed it, meaning give them to the disciples. And the disciples gave it to the crowds. And all ate and were filled. And the Bible says, and they took up that which was left, 12 baskets full. And all those who ate were about 5,000 men not including the women and the children. You may be seated in the very presence of the Lord. I, I want to preach, I want to preach um, this morning um, um, by 
with your prayers, needing God's power, simply from these words, redefining our problems. Redefining our problems. Re redefining what a problem is. Amen. Turn to somebody, look him or her in the eye and says, neighbor, we need to redefine our problems. Amen. You may be seated, the ushers, in the very presence of, of the Lord. I'm, I'm willing to say um, this morning that um, probably one of the things that uh, all of us have in, in common um, is our propensity to um, classify issues as we, that we face in life as problematic. Um, I'm willing to say that uh, one of the things that all of us have in common is that when we are faced with challenges, when we are faced with, with difficulties, that one of the things that all of us uh, in the building are guilty of is that we will classify uh, those challenges, those issues as problematic. Uh, we, 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 have no, we have no reservations. We will tell somebody in a heartbeat um, that we're having a problem. Sometimes folk come up to us out of sheer uh, courtesy. They really don't want to know, but out of courtesy, they'll, they'll ask, how you doing? And, and the first thing out of our mouth is how bad things are, and we'll start um, talking about our, our problems. They, they really don't want to know about them, but uh, out of formality, they'll ask, how you doing? And the first thing out of our mouth is that uh, we'll start talking about problems. Everybody say problems. And, and interesting uh, enough, um, we use this label, um, problems, when we are faced with questions or situations that create uncertainty or, or, or difficulty in our lives. We, we even label um, children as, as problems. Um, that child that's causing us to pray extra hard uh, will label that particular child as the problem child. We'll label that relational situation that's causing us to lay prostrate on the floor uh, that make us trust God. We'll label that as a problem marriage or a problem relationship. Uh, we'll, we'll label our financial situation, the one that we're in, that's causing us to trust God uh, in the area of our stewardship. When folk ask how we're doing, we'll state that we're having problems in the area of our finances. However, my assignment this morning is to kind of shed light on the fact that everything that we call and classify as a, a problem may not be a problem. Uh, in fact, I hear God telling me to tell someone that the things that we call uh, problems are really uh, opportunities in disguise. Uh, that the things that we label as problems, what they really are is uh, are opportunities rather for God uh, to get glory. It's an opportunity for God uh, to be magnified. These issues and areas that we have labeled as problematic, um, the Lord shared with me that what they really are, they are uh, faith-building situations, that uh, they are opportunities for us to see another aspect of God, that they are an opportunity, Thomas, for us to see God uh, show up in a major way. Kind of reminds me in John chapter 9, the first few verses, when Jesus was walking along with his uh, disciples. The Bible says that his disciples uh, uh, see a young man that was born blind. And they posed the question to Jesus, um, Jesus, who sinned that uh, this man would be uh, born blind? And, and, and Jesus had to redefine that situation. Uh, um, Jesus said in John 9 that, that neither man sinned, um, that this man is, is blind. But Jesus said that he was born blind so that God's work might be revealed in him. In other words, Jesus had to reclassify that thing. Jesus said that the man's blindness was not about this man's wrongs, but were about God's willingness to work. 
that, that th th this man's situation had nothing to do um, with an issue on the behalf of his parents or him, but what you call a problem uh, is an opportunity for God uh, to do something major uh, in this man's life. C could it be, my brothers and my sisters, uh, um, that the things that we are classifying uh, as problematic uh, are really nothing but God's the desire to be glorified in that area could could it be my brothers and my sisters um, that the child that we have classified as problematic uh, uh, is the child that God wants to be glorified through could it be that maybe the issue uh, that you've been walking the floor over the issue uh, that you've been laying up at night about the issue uh, that has been causing you to cry needless tears the one that you are quick to label as problematic could it be brothers and sisters that that issue is nothing but God's opportunity to show up and to show out to let everybody in your context know that I am God and beside me there is no other well, this morning, I wanted to unpack this text because uh, if there was ever a, a, a particular perigope that posed problematic uh, in the life of the disciples, uh, surely uh, it was this text. You, 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 you're familiar um, with this particular story. Um, the, the, the Bible, um, the historical context uh, is that the, the disciples are with Jesus Christ. Um, Jesus Christ has heard word um, that his cousin, John the Baptist, was uh, beheaded. And, and the Bible says... Uh, that he intentionally withdraws to a, a deserted place. Watch this, not to pour into people. Uh, he, he, he goes to a deserted place. I'm uh, not to release a word to the people, uh, but to receive a word from God. Uh, he, he goes to a deserted place, uh, not to do ministry, uh, but to retreat from ministry. Uh, he, he goes to this deserted place, uh, uh, not to have church, but he goes to this place to get away from church. Oh, y'all don't like me today. I, I, I want to park to suggest that every now and then that, that, that we have to pull back from the, the responsibilities of ministry uh, to be ministered to. Uh, that, that every now and then we must pull back from our areas of responsibility uh, to allow God uh, to speak to us in a fresh way. Well, well, the Bible says that the people um, saw, I'm going somewhere, the direction that Jesus um, was traveling in. And the Bible says that by the time Jesus, watch this, um, gets to the other side of the lake, uh, the Bible says that the crowd ha ha has made their way around to the other side. And, and Jesus, being the compassionate Christ, uh, he puts his personal pain on the back burner and he begins to minister uh, to the crowd. Uh, aren't y'all glad that, that we serve that kind of God, that, that we serve the kind of God that can prioritize our needs? The Bible says that when Jesus, uh, he sees the crowd, I'm going somewhere. The text says that he has compassion on them. Uh, he begins to minister to them. He begins to heal their sick. And now all of a sudden, the Bible suggests that the hour has grown late. Watch this. Uh, the people are hungry. Um, they have received spiritual things, but now they are in need of physical food. And the disciples notice a problem. Can the church say a problem? The problem is that there are at least, according to verse 21, 5,000 people, not including the women and the children, and the people are hungry. Watch this. The disciples come up to Jesus Christ. And they pose the problem to Jesus. They say, Jesus, we have already um, surveyed the situation. We've already checked things out. And, 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 and we have a problem. The problems are, number one, there are no facilities where we are. Not only are there no facilities, but secondly, Lord, there's no food. And not only is it no food, but we have no finances uh, uh, even to purchase food. We're in a deserted 
place. Uh, uh, um, um, the, uh, our, our pantry uh, is depleted. The place is deserted. Uh, and we have some poor disciples that we're in a situation now where, 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 where th this meeting was not on the agenda, that we have not budgeted for this particular conference. Uh, um, the, uh, th th this, this ministerial uh, uh, engagement was not uh, uh, on, on the on the uh, uh, in the budget. This this retreat in this deserted place uh, was not something that we planned for. It was not something that we prepared for. Uh, in fact, God, we didn't even invite these folk here. That that, that, that they took it upon themselves uh, to follow us over here. Uh, that they didn't come by invitation. Uh, we didn't send any letters out. We didn't invite them to come. Uh, they heard through the grapevine. In fact, they were spying on you. Uh, and when they saw the direction that you were traveling in, they took it upon themselves to follow you and meet you in this place. And if they are hungry, and if they are tired, and if they are fatigued, it's nobody's fault but theirs. And so we have concluded, we've called a meeting among the disciples, we've already voted, and we have decided that the only solution to this problem is to send them away. Uh, 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 let, let them leave the same way they came. In fact, the same way they got over here. Let them take their behind back the same way they came. Lord, let me preach this thing here today. I, I, I'm look at how um, the disciples wanted to solve the problem. The, the, it was their desire to solve the problem. Watch this by avoiding the problem. Uh, it was their way of solving the situation. Uh, watch this by causing the problem to be eliminated. Can the church say eliminated? However, what Jesus does in the text, Jesus takes this as an opportunity uh, to redefine what a problem really is. Because everybody didn't look at the situation the same way. Yeah, G G Jesus, G Jesus knew I'm going somewhere, that they were in a deserted place. G Jesus knew, he knew, he, he knew that the pantry was depleted. He knew that the disciples were poor. Uh, he knew there was no food. He knew there was no facilities. Uh, he knew there was no finances. Uh, however, what shouts me about the text is uh, the Lord took this as an opportunity uh, to teach them how to redefine what a problem is. Look, look at how the Lord handles um, this situation. Um, the Lord, I want to suggest, teaches them three things about problems I want to share with you this morning. And the first thing that he teaches them about problems, watch this, uh, is that problems are transcendable. Problems can be transcended. Can the church say transcended? Jesus says, watch this, uh, make the men sit down. J Jesus says in verse 15, don't, don't, don't don't, don't, verse 16, don't send the crowd away. Watch this. Ver, ver, verse 15, if your Bibles are open, um, um, the disciples said, send them away. But in verse 16, Jesus says, there's no need, watch this, to send the crowd away. Because Jesus is getting ready to show them that in the midst of a problem, you can rise above it. That, that, that you don't have to make the problems go away. But, but I, I'm the kind of God that in the face of a situation, I can turn things around. Uh, Jesus' mindset is, watch this, that in the midst of a situation that will be a challenge to your faith, a challenge to your finances, you've got to understand that there is a way that you can rise above your circumstance. That you don't have to try to eliminate the problem. You you don't have to try to avoid the problem. In fact, there's a way that you can take on the problem head on and still get the glory. In fact, because you don't know who you're sitting beside, just tap your neighbor and say, neighbor, you can rise above the problem. Say, say that neighbor, you, you, you can rise above the problem. That, that You don't have to let the problem make you try to employ a tactic of avoidism. But what you can do is you can look the problem in the face and have the confidence knowing that this is not going to cause me to lose my faith. As long as Jesus is in the context, I believe that everything will be all right. 
watch, watch this, watch this, watch this. That word transcend, watch this. The word transcend literally means to rise above. The, the word transcend, watch this. The word transcend literally means, it means to surpass. Jesus says to these disciples, watch this. The lesson that you need to learn is not a lesson about elimination. It's a lesson on elevation. I'm getting ready to show you that you don't have to try to make the problem go away. I'm getting ready to show you in the midst of a potential problem, I can rise you up above. Oh, y'all ain't hearing me. In fact, the words of David comes back to my mind in Psalm 27, verse number 1 through 6. You familiar with Psalm 27? David says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. The Lord is the strength of my life. Watch this. David suggests that even when wicked and my enemies and my foes came upon me, they eat up my flesh. David said, they stumbled and fell. Then he said, though a host encamp against me, even in this shell, watch this, I be confident. But in verse number six, David says that the Lord will lift my head above mine enemies. David suggests in the midst of a problematic situation, if God is on your side, what God will do is he will lift your head up above your adversaries. And somebody under the sound of my voice this morning needs to know uh, that when a problem uh, is posed in your situation, uh, you don't have to try to send the problem away. All you have to do is trust that God will uh, lift you up above the situation. Uh, in fact, I don't know who I'm talking to, uh, but the Lord has told me to tell somebody in this house uh, that your problem can be transcended, uh, that you don't have to let your problems take you under, but you have to have the confidence of knowing uh, that if God is in your life, if God is in your context, if God is the captain of your ship, you have to believe, Carol, that some kind of way I'm rising above the situation. I don't know who I'm going to have to step on. I don't know what stumbling blocks God is going to put me up on. I don't know what haters I'm going to have to step on. But I do believe some kind of way God is in the process of lifting me up. And I need somebody in this house this morning who believe with all of your heart that you serve the kind of God that is willing and able to lift you up. Gosh, I, fish. I wish I felt better this morning. Watch this, watch this, watch this. G G G Jesus says, let me, let me look into the text. G G Jesus says in verse number 16, he says, watch this, that th there's no need, that th there's no need to send the people away. Uh, in fact, in verse 16, he says, the B clause, he says, give them something to eat. Does your Bible say that? One translation puts it this way. He says, um, get ready to feed them. In, in other words, the, the Lord is saying, watch this. I'm so confident that you can rise above this situation. Uh, create an atmosphere of expectancy in the minds of the people. Uh, have them sit down. In other words, I'm so confident that you're going to rise above this situation. Uh, prepare yourself for the miracle. You see, Jesus would have, you missed it. He would have never told them to sit down. He would have never told them to get ready. He would have never told them to get an atmosphere of expectancy if he had not planned on doing something. And the mere fact he says, feed them. Uh, uh, you see, because you got to understand, saints of God, that the Lord don't tell us to do stuff that he know we cannot do. So if he tells us to step out on faith, it's because he know we can have faith. If he tells us to feed the people, it is because he already knows uh, that some kind of way there's going to be some food. So the mere fact he tells the disciples uh, to feed them uh, lets me know that God already had provisions in mind. In other words, he was telling them uh, to get ready for the miracle. Oh, I don't know who that word was for today, but I feel God pushing me to tell somebody that you need to get ready for the miracle. You need to start preparing yourself right now.
because Elaine, in the same area that you are struggling in, God says, I'm getting ready to turn some stuff around. Now, what I want to know is, can you do it? Can you get excited before the manifestation? Can you shout before he turn it around? Can you shout in the preparation period? Or do you have to wait till he do it? Do you have to wait till the battle is over? Do you have to wait until God turn it around? Do you have enough faith right where you are to stand on your feet and give God maximum praise because you believe that something is getting ready to happen? Tell, tell, tell somebody close, I'm getting ready for it. Oh, you didn't say it like you really were. I said tell somebody close that you are preparing for your miracle. I'm preparing for my manifestation. That's why when you see me coming to church giving God crazy praise, it's not because I'm debt free. It's because I'm preparing for it. When you see me come to church giving God praise, it's not because my body is healed. I'm preparing for a clean bill of health. When you see me come to church running around the building, it's not because I'm married. It's because I'm preparing for it. When you come and you see me come to church giving God crazy praise, it's not because he brought me out. It's because he's preparing me for it. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to shout like I already got it. I'm going to shout like I'm already healed. I'm going to shout like I'm already delivered. I'm going to shout like it's already done. Sit down. Watch this. I got, I got a long way to go. Sit down. Watch this, G. So, so, so watch this. Watch this. Watch this. Here's... <laughs> Y'all going to make me preach. Watch this. Here, here's the problem in the text. The problem is we are in a deserted place. I, I mean, there's no facilities. Um, there's no food. There's no finances. Are y'all hearing me today? Um, um, we, we're, we're in a bad situation. The people are hungry. Um, but, but Jesus says, watch this. Jesus says that they don't have to go away. Because I need to teach you how to redefine what a problem is. And the first definition of a problem is that the problem can be transcended. That you can rise above it. Just slap five with your neighbor's neighbor. You can rise above it. So, so watch this. So the disciples, the disciples, they're, they're trying. Y'all got your Bible still open? The, the disciples are trying to be obedient. So what they do is in verse 16, the Bible says, watch this, that they come back to Jesus Christ. In verse 17, they, they, they reconnoitre the area. And they say, Lord, uh, 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 we, we have something. But, 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 but what we have is not enough. Uh, because all we have, watch this, are, are just five loaves and two little fish. Verse 17, that's all we have. All we have uh, is is five lo barley loaves of bread and two little measly pieces of fish. However, look at what the Lord does because the disciples look at the fish and the loaves and they see not enough. But Jesus looks at the fish and the loaves and he sees more than enough. You miss what I just said. The disciples look at the fish and the loaves and they see not enough. But Jesus looks at the same loaves. He focuses on the same fish and he sees more than enough. So look at the second lesson. Everybody say the second lesson. Look at the second lesson that Jesus teaches them about problems. He teaches us, number one, that the problem can be transcended. But then secondly, he teaches them, oh, I love it, that the problem can be transferred. Can the church say transferred? Because Jesus says, bring it to me. Okay, okay, okay. Um, I knew I was going to get that, um, that reaction, um, so I got to explain it. Um, when Jesus says, bring it to me, uh, what he's really doing is saying this. He is saying, uh, take it out your hands and put it in my hands. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When, when Jesus says, give it to me, what he's really doing is saying, take it out of your hands and put it in my hands because what is a problem in your hands really is not a pro. You missed what I just said. What may be a problem in your hands is positively no problems in the hands of the Lord. So the question is, whose hands are your problems in? Because if your problems are in your hands, I can understand 
understand why you walk in some floors. If the problem is in your hands, I can understand why you tripping at night. But oh, if you ever take the problem out of your hands and put the problem in the Lord's hands, I'm a living, moving, preaching witness that God can turn that thing around because little becomes much when you put it in. Keith, you'll love this one. You'll, you'll love this. I, I call I, I call my cousin um, Alfredo um, last night. My cousin Fredo, he's a um, coach with the Cleveland Browns in Lafayette. I called him um, last night and, and I said, "Cuz, um, 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 what what is what what is um, the most um, basic um, offensive play um, in in football? I, I mean, what is I mean, what is uh, the most basic play?" Uh, in, 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 in football, offensively speaking. And he, and he thought for a minute, and he said, because um, um, the most basic, the most um, elementary um, play uh, in, uh, in, in football, I mean, the one that they learned from Pop Warner to the pros, uh, he said the most basic play, watch this, is uh, the exchange between the center and the quarterback. He said, that, 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 that's the most basic play. I, I said, well, explain. He says, well, you got to understand, cause uh, that, that nothing can happen uh, offensively. Uh, he, he says, no progress can be made uh, offensively uh, until the center uh, gets the ball out of his hands uh, and put the ball in the hands of the quarterback. Uh, he says, I don't, I don't care how awesome your running backs are. I, I don't care how awesome the tight ends are. I don't care how powerful your offensive line is. I don't care how strong of an arm your quarterback has. He says that nothing can happen offensively until the center takes the ball out of his hands and puts the ball in the quarterback's hand. Oh, I said, oh, thank you because I got enough. Because the Holy Spirit told me to tell somebody that problems are just like footballs, that you can make no progress until you take the problem out of your hand and transfer it into the hands of your quarterback. And I don't know who your quarterback is is, uh, but I got a quarterback in heaven uh, who sits high and looks low. My quarterback is named Jesus Christ, uh, and I'm a living witness uh, that when you take it out of your hands uh, and put it into his hands, uh, every I, I dare you to tell your neighbor, neighbor, put it in his hands. Well, well, let me see if I can, let, let me see uh, if, if I can prove it in the text. I got a lot of preachers here. Let me see if I can prove it in the text. I, I want to suggest I want to suggest, when you look at the fish and, and the loaves of bread, I, I want to suggest, Mr. Higgs, that uh, it changed hands at, at, at least three times before Jesus got it. Uh-huh, uh-huh, it's in the text. Uh, uh, um, num number one, uh, it was in the hands of the person that packed the lunch. Uh-huh, uh, it was in the hands of the person that ported the lunch. And then it was in the hands of the perfect people that presented the lunch. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, but, but, but before Jesus got it, uh, it was in the hands of the woman who bought the lunch. Before Jesus got it, it was in the hands of the little boy who brought the lunch. Before Jesus got it, it was in the hands of the disciples who went to salt the lunch. But I want to suggest when it was in the hands of the mother, it was only enough for one. When it was in the hands of the little boy, it was only enough for one. When it was in the hands of the disciples, uh, it was only enough for one. However, when it got out of the hands of the packer and got out of the hands of the porter and got out of the hands of the presenter and was in the hands of the provider, uh, then what was not enough became more than enough. Uh, so I got to get out of here. But before I do, let me just tell somebody in the building uh, that when you put it in the hands of the provider, he will make a difference. I want to tell somebody right now, if you got a problem in your marriage, put it in his hands. If you got a problem with your child, put them in his hands. If you got a problem financially, put it in his hands. Because I'm a living witness that his hands makes the... Oh, y'all ain't hearing me. You see, you, you, you see, the situation changes depending on whose hands they're in. Well, the Bible says, watch this, the Bible says that after Jesus received the loaves and the fish, the Bible says, as I hasten to finish, that um, he, 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 he looked up and, and the Bible says he did three things, that he looked up and he, he blessed the food, he broke the food, 
and then he bestowed it to his disciples. And his disciples, according to the text, gave it to the crowds. That's verse 19. And then the Bible says all of a sudden, um, 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 everybody um, ate. Everybody say everybody ate. And then the Bible says that everybody was filled. But, but what caught my eye, Sister Vaughn, what, 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 what was that piece in verse 20 that, that said that they took up what was left over. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, 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 th th the third lesson that the text teaches us is that problems can not only be transcended and transferred, but problems can be transformed. B because what's interesting in the text uh, is that um, some kind of way, uh, what used to be lack is now leftovers. <laughs> Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You may not get that, but uh, it shouted at me. Uh, what, what used to be shortage is now surplus. Uh, what, what, what used to be a, a problem is now provisional. What, 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 what was not enough is now more than enough. What was for one now turns out to be for many. And, 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 and therefore, uh, um, um, what, what, what shouts me about the text is that it teaches us that, that problems can be transformed. That what was an issue uh, don't have to stay an issue. B because this text teaches us uh, that problems, oh, y'all ain't here me uh, are not unalterable uh, uh, but problems are transformable uh, that that problems can be altered problems uh, can be transformed uh, that your problems don't have to stay the same way in fact touch your neighbor say neighbor they can change in, in, in fact, in fact, what I love about the text, uh, as I hasten to close, is this. Uh, when you look at this text, uh, when you analyze uh, verse 13 through 21, uh, Lou, um, you, you, you can't tell um, where the transformation took place. Uh, you, you, you can't tell. Watch this. You, you can't tell at what point um, the food multiplied. You, you, you can't tell at what point um, the food was transformed. And that's what shouts me about the Lord is this, that, that, that you don't don't know how he's going to do it. You don't know when he's going to do it. Uh, you, you, you don't know uh, at, at what verse in the in, in your life script that God is going to transform it. Uh, you don't know at what point in your personal narrative uh, that God is going to transform it. Uh, all you know is uh, that you look up one day and you got a problem uh, and you look the next day and the problem is gone. Uh, that's what we did in this text. We looked at the text in one verse uh, and it wasn't enough. And we looked at the next verse and it was more than enough we looked at the text one time and it was enough food for one little boy and we looked at the text another time and it was enough to feed 5,000 men not including the women and children and to have 12 baskets left oh you missed your chance to shout because I just told you that you don't know when God is going to do it and because you don't know when God is going to do it what you then must do my brothers and my sisters uh, is you must prepare for transformation uh, because transformation can come at any minute uh, because you don't know what point transformation is going to come. What you got to do is you got to live every day like this may be the day that your problems are going to be transformed. Uh, you must treat every moment uh, like this just may be the moment uh, that God is going to transform my situation uh, and so my brothers and my sisters uh, because I know not the moment uh, because I know not the minute uh, because I know not the hour because I know not the day that God is going to transform my situation uh, I can't waste time uh, having private little pity parties uh, over a pressing problem uh, that's really not a problem at all uh, I can't waste time uh, on tripping over a situation uh, that's really not a situation uh, because I got to realize uh, that God is so awesome uh, that he can literally transform my problem uh, literally at any minute. Uh, in fact, turn your neighbor and tell your neighbor God is transforming it right now. And so, brothers and sisters, uh, as I hasten to close, uh, I've come to the conclusion uh, that I'm redefining what my problems are. In fact, I'm no longer declaring uh, that I have a problem. Uh, what I have are GGOs. Uh, can the church say GGOs? Uh, and a GGO is this. Uh, it is a God, a glorifiable opportunity. Uh, and so I no longer have problems uh, with cancer. What I have is uh, a God-glorifiable opportunity. 
opportunity with my health. I don't have financial problems. I have God glorifiable opportunities within my finances. I don't have no longer marital problems. I have God glorifiable opportunities within my current relationship. I no longer have a flesh problem. But what I have is a God glorifiable opportunity with my carnal nature. I no longer have a problem with my child. What I have is a God glorifiable opportunity with my offspring. I no longer have a drug problem. But what I have is a God glorifiable opportunity in the area of codependence. And because I know God the way I know God, I'm more than convinced that if this is nothing but a God glorifiable opportunity, I'm no longer going to have a pity party. I'm no longer going to walk floors because now I know that God allowed me to have what looks like a problem just to get some glory. And if anybody know God, the one thing you know is he is going to get glory. And so in fact, turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, I'm a glory story. Oh, you didn't do it. Say, neighbor, I'm a glory story. My husband is a glory story. My wife, can I preach a little bit? My wife is a glory story. My finances are a glory stories. I'm more than convinced that God allowed me to go through what I'm going through just to get Give him uh, maximum glory. Uh, in fact, your name may be uh, Lazarus because the Bible says uh, he let Lazarus uh, die. He let Lazarus uh, stink. He let Lazarus uh, be buried uh, and stay dead for three long days uh, just so uh, he can get glory. Uh, but when he showed up, uh, the Bible says uh, he who was dead uh, came back to life. Uh, and I don't know, I feel like preaching. I don't know who I'm talking to, but there's somebody in the building. God told me to tell you, you ain't got a problem. What you have is a God glorifiable opportunity. And the question is, are you going to let him get his glory? Are you going to let him get his honor? In fact, tell your neighbor, stop complaining. I feel like preaching. Stop complaining, but let God get glory. Stop crying, but let God get glory. Stop whining, but let God get glory. Because when God get glory, you will be exalted. It be all right. It be all right. I need some help. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, I wasn't always like I am. But say, neighbor, I've gone through storms and rain. But neighbor, God brought me out. And when he brought me out, it was for his glory. When he brought me out, it was for his glory. And I got to get out of here. But before I leave, I told the Lord, whatever you do, get your glory. If I got to cry, get your glory. If I got to be sick, get your glory. If I got to suffer, get your glory. If I got to get divorced, get your glory. If I got to walk floors, get your glory. Whatever. Uh, whatever you got to do, get your glory. I'm finished. Just help me. Just turn to somebody and say, neighbor. I don't have problems. I have God. Glorifiable opportunities. Come on, if you receive that, 
Come on, if you receive that. Daryl, if you receive that, I ain't got no problem. I have God. Glorifiable opportunities. Redefining, redefining your, your problems. Redefining your problems. You think you got a problem. It's not a problem. It's an opportunity for God to get glory. So the question then becomes, why do I keep having them? Obviously, because God want to keep receiving it. He wants glory. And so the only way he can get it is to put you in a situation wherein when he turned it around, I was, did this make sense, G? I, I, does this make sense? It, it makes sense to me. So here it is. Please don't miss this. So here it is, 5,000 men, not including the women and children, two fish, five loaves of bread. Jesus says, feed them. Fe feed them. Wait a minute. But this is a problem. No, 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 no. This is not a problem. Because you need to know, we're going to transcend this. Transfer it. And when you transfer it, I'll transform it. Bring me what you got. Put it in my hands. And let me do the rest. Can, can I talk to somebody in this house? God, I'm out of time, but God is telling me to tell somebody, take it out your hands. Put it in his hands. He, he, he know what it is. Your, your it ain't like my it, but you got an it. But whatever it is, take it out your hands and put it in his hands. And once you do the transferring, Sister so Pringle, God will do the transforming. And that which was lack will be turned into leftover. Come on, give God a strong hand to praise. Pastor Lewis is coming.